Now, to tell you a little more about uh, the uh, Tokai Asu, uh, the dessert wine, as I mentioned, the grapes that are affected by the Botrytis cinerea, this fungus, okay, as I said, this skin is broken, it's penetrated by the fungus, and the water evaporates. Now, the grape then becomes in uh, like a raisin. Now, these grapes are picked, this is very late in the season, they, okay, they're picked very late in the season, usually, October, November even, I've seen some, and, uh, or even later. And uh, usually what happens is the grapes, these botrytized grapes are added to either the fermenting must of dry wine, still wine, dry still wine, or uh, the already fermented must uh, of the uh, still wine, dry wine. Now there's a lot of the soaking, the soaking goes on and then there's a gentle pressing again. Okay, and, and then you get that, that mix of the sweetness and the freshness. And uh, the amount of sugar, what, the, there is something called putunyosh. Okay, this gets complicated. You have a system where, well, up until recently, you had a system called three putunyosh, four putunyosh, five putunyosh, and six putunyosh. The petunios, the this word rec is, represents a hod. You, if you know in history, the old wooden hods, they're like buckets carried on the shoulders of, for, during the grape harvest and the grapes were put inside the uh, grape hods, okay? So these, that used to be the measurement of the sweetness for the Tokai Asu. So if you had three petunios or three hods, then you had a certain level of a sugar or sweetness going to be in that wine. You had five hods, that's five putunios, even more sweetness. Today, it gets complicated, but today it's about a, a minimum of residual sugar. Now, it became such a complicated system that just a few years back, the three putunios and four putunios levels were abolished. So you might still find some three petunios and four petunios Tokayasu wines, uh, but they're not produced anymore. Um, but the important thing to remember is because of their sugar levels, the residual sugar levels, the ageability at lifespan is incredible for Tokayas. And the sweeter, uh, the longer, usually it's gonna last. So uh, you could find uh, three and four between your shop there, but they're, they're not really uh, made anymore, not really. Now the minimum sh residual sugar level for the Tokayasu would be 120 grams per liter. This would be a five Petunios, the equivalent of a five Petunios Tokayasu. The six Petunios Tokayasu would be around 150 grams on up of residual sugar per liter. Now, all Tokai Asu, if it's called an Asu, uh, there's a minimum of 18 months in oak. These are usually a, a barrique sized barrel. And the release can only be as of January 1st of the third year following the harvest. So a harvest of say 2020, if you have a Tokai Asu, five petunios or six petunios, it could be released only as of January 1st, 2023. Okay, now that's just Tokai Asu. <laughs> then we have Tokai Essentia. Essentia is the pure free run juice of those botrytized grapes. Okay, all those raisin-like grapes I told you about, the pure free run juice of those grapes. Um, this can, the level of sugar, residual sugar can be 400, 500, 700 grams of residual sugar per liter. And uh, it is considered such a delicacy. I mean, some people would say it's not even wine, but you will pay hundreds and hundreds of euros for some of this. 
and uh, to taste it is amazing. It is like a nectar, uh, but the, the the beautiful flavors, the honey, the peach, the apricot, the dried apricot, um, the exotic uh, tropical flavors, and the acidity uh, and combined. And you're talking about an alcohol level of maybe 3%. It is absolutely fantastic. It is a true experience. And the texture, it's like silk. It's absolutely like silk. It's amazing. Um, I'll mention some top producers of Tokai Azu. Uh, Istvan Sepshi, I told you about uh, before. He's like the grandfather of them all, if you will. Uh, there's a uh, Zoltan Demeter. Uh, there's the winery Disnoku, Oremus, the Royal Tokai Wine Company, Chateau Medjer. Now, I mentioned like Disnoku, Oremus, Royal Tokai Wine Company. These are three companies that uh, way back in the very um, early 1990s, when the communist uh, government fell and the free economy took over, uh, the investment came from France, from Spain, from Britain. These companies were part of that. And uh, they have done a wonderful job in producing high quality Tokai. In fact, the Royal Tokai Wine Company, one of its investors or shareholders, if you will, I'm sorry, shareholders is uh, Hugh Johnson, the very famous British wine writer and uh, authority. Uh, he, is, he is one of the truly great uh, wine experts and really from the old school, really traditional old school. And he's been around a long time and uh, has written great books. And uh, he he's a uh, still a shareholder in the Royal Tokai Wine Company. Now, having said that, I've ex uh, explained to you about Tokai Asu. Now, there's another. <laughs> get ready. There's another style called Samarodni. And the Samorodni, Tokai Samorodni, uh, these are grapes picked as they are or as they come. That's what Samorodni means. So the wine is consisting of bunches of fresh and botrytized grapes that are picked together. They're picked, pressed, and vinified together. There's no separation of the grapes like with Tokai Asu. Now, within Samarodni, you have a sweet style called Edish, which is, could be like, you know, between 50 and 100 grams of residual sugar per liter. And then you have dry or Zarash. The Zarash is a very interesting wine. It's, it's, um, it's now, it used to be more plentiful. It's now rare. Uh, it's fermented to dryness under a layer of floor, you know, the veil of yeast that develops on the surface of the wine in, in the barrel. Similar to a sherry, like a fino or a manzanilla. And so you get this great nutty flavored dry wine. Like I said, like it's like a fino, like a manzanilla, and it's delicious. It used to be very, very plentiful. And now, very because of the complication of it, uh, there aren't that many producers anymore. Ironically, one of the main producers of it is French, uh, Samuel Tinon, and he makes some really beautiful examples. And I encourage you to try a Zamorodny Zarash. Okay, this is a dry Zamorodny style Tokai. Now, there's so much more I could tell you about Hungary and the Hungarian wine scene. It is very, very extensive. Uh, it is very diverse. And as I said, just to recap, I mean, you have the beautiful dry white wines. Um, you have, as I said now, Olash Riesling, which was the very plentiful or which is very plentiful, voluminous. Um, but and some producers are now really going into the quality level of it, uh, to a higher, higher um, plane. 
and uh, like around the north of Lake Balaton. Um, some absolutely stunningly beautiful, dry, minerally Olash Riesling. Furmint, first and foremost, this is the grape that Hungary is using as its flagship dry white wine. It is, um, as I said to you, in Furmint, it is a half sibling of Riesling and uh, Chardonnay, or half siblings of, the, of, of Furmint. And uh, it has this Riesling character. So if you know Riesling, say, in, from Germany or Austria, and you know it has that wonderful acidity, uh, that pronounced acidity, that beautiful stone fruit character. Um, for mint, is Riesling-esque in its expression. And it can make lovely age-worthy wines as well. Especially, you know, if it's when it's ripe, it has beautiful age-worthy uh, character to it. And then you also have the Harsh Levelu. Don't forget the Harsh Levelu, who has Furmint as one of its parents. So you have that minerality, but you have it's a little bit broader in its expression, a little more. It's definitely more aromatic, okay, and um, it it complements Furmint when blended with it especially, as I said, in the Tokai Asu, but it stands alone very well also, Harsh Levelu. And uh, these are two grapes to really, really look out for in terms of white wines in Hungary, Furmint and Harsh Levelu, great single varietals uh, as dry wines. And in the red zone, again, look for a nice Kek Frankosch, very, very nice, very fresh, fruity. Again, it, it has a kind of a, uh, well, I don't want to say Pinot Noir style, but it's going in a, in a burgundy direction, okay? Uh, more of a vertical structure, uh, beautiful, juicy red fruits, and um, very good expression, definitely age-worthy. And it's, a, it's an ideal blend grape as well. So it, it, it's also blended very, very nicely as a component with the uh, Bordeaux grape varieties of you know, the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Cabernet Franc, Merlot. You can have a Kek Francoche there. And again, uh, you would find this, um, if you want to look at tradition, but look at what some top winemakers are doing with the, which once, once used to be the uh, simple everyday Planck wine called uh, Bica there or Bull's Blood. You have the Agri Bicaver in Eger, the blend, but now you have also the premium styles, okay? Very, very high level styles. And also in Sexard, you have very, very high quality examples of Bicaver. But again, in these regions, don't just focus on, like in Eger and Sexard, don't just focus on Bicaver. Uh, excellent, excellent wineries are there. Uh, what they're doing with Bordeaux grapes, what they're doing with Pinot Noir, especially in Eger, or what they're doing with uh, Cake Francoche. Um, excellent versions. In Sexard, also look at what they're doing with Kadarka. Very important grape, very temperamental, as I said. Uh, going in more like a burgundy direction, uh, going in the style of a Pinot Noir. Uh, it's temperamental like Pinot Noir, that's for sure. And, um, but really, really worth the exploration and, and uh, enjoyment. So you have these wonderful, th this is what I've told you today, is just a smattering of what is produced in Hungary. But I mentioned some of the top wines and uh, no matter what you do, explore Tokai. It is truly one of the great regions of the world and uh, the Tokai Asu is truly one of the great, if not the greatest, if I may say so, dessert wines of the world. So thank you for listening and uh, keep paying attention to Hungary. Thank you very much.